Good afternoon everybody. This is a 1997 Bentley Turbo R and it might just be the most important Bentley in modern history. As I'm sure most of you are aware, Bentley was owned by Rolls-Royce between 1931 and 1998, and for most of that time, the Bentley mark was neglected and left with cars that had very little to differentiate them from their Rolls-Royce counterparts. In 1980, only 3% of the cars they sold were Bentleys, and the situation was so dire that Rolls-Royce later admitted that they seriously considered dropping the mark altogether. There was just very little incentive to go out and buy a Bentley over a Rolls-Royce. But this is the car that really changed that. It helped modernise the brand and led Bentley down the path that took them towards Volkswagen ownership in the late 90s. Without this car, there's a very good chance that modern Bentleys just wouldn't exist. The story of the Turbo R starts in 1980 with the introduction of the SZ series. This line made up the majority of their cars between 1980 and the early 2000s, starting with the Rolls-Royce Silver Spirit and Silver Spur alongside the Bentley Mulsanne. At this point, the cars were pretty much identical, but since the mid 70s, there had been plans to create something a little bit more special. And there was good reason for that as well, as sales across the two marks had fallen in recent years. So not only was this car important to the Bentley mark, but also to the company as a whole to galvanise interest in both Rolls-Royce and Bentley. Work began in a small team of six engineers, and by 1982 at the Geneva Motor Show, Bentley had finally rekindled its gentleman racer philosophy with the reveal of the Mulsanne Turbo. Now this wasn't a performance machine by any stretch of the imagination, but it injected some life into the range with its Garrett turbocharger plumbed into the famous six and three quarter litre V8. And it made just under 300 brake horsepower. Now the Mulsanne Turbo was the car that kick-started the revival, but only a couple of years later in 1985, the Turbo R was revealed. While produced alongside each other for a few months, the new Turbo R effectively replaced the Mulsanne Turbo, bringing a rather staid company in engineering terms, kicking and screaming into the 1980s. First of all, we have the improvements to the power plant. Under here, or at least underneath all these plastic covers, is the famous six and three quarter litre L series V8, the same unit from the Mulsanne Turbo, and the same engine you could still find in a modern Bentley Mulsanne until just last month. June 2020. The 60 year life of this engine is testament to its original strength, but then again, maybe that also says something about Bentley. A big old pushrod V8 and a stonking great turbocharger to deliver the grunt. The Turbo R's engine is the L410, and power climbed throughout production with the addition of Bosch fuel injection, more modern boost control, and water to air intercooling, bringing the power figure up in this final year of production to 385 brake horsepower. Now that isn't massively impressive for a six and three quarter litre V8, but 554 pound feet of torque is a little bit more like it. Those figures are transferred from the old fashioned low revving overhead valve engine to the road through a General Motors 4L80E four speed automatic transmission. That's a big improvement from the early Turbo R with its three speed box. This combination allows a 0-60 sprint in 6.2 seconds and a top speed of about 150 miles per hour. Bearing in mind for a second that this is a 25 year old car weighing about 2.4 tonnes. Making a car that weighs so much go around corners is never easy, especially when it has this much grunt. Previous cars weren't exactly handling machines. They had a reputation for supreme comfort, yes, but when it came to the corners, they were known for being a little bit roly-poly. As I mentioned earlier, the engineering department was rather conservative, so the transformation from 1980 Mulsanne to 1997 Turbo R is a pretty big one. The suspension across SZ series cars is a modified version of Citroen's brilliant hydrogen pneumatic system, but on the Turbo R especially, big modifications had to be made. The roly-poly style of typical 1970s and 1980s Rolls Royces and Bentleys just wouldn't cut it for a car of this calibre. The R in Turbo R stands for road holding, and this improvement is achieved through the stiffening up of many of the components. 
After the appointment of Mike Dunn as engineering director in 1983, the bar was raised and the new car now had to be a lot better in the corners than the Mulsanne Turbo. To meet Dunn's targets, the shock absorbers themselves are stiffer, the subframe mountings are stiffened and the anti-roll bars were stiffened dramatically by 100% at the front and 60% at the rear and a panhard rod was put in at the back. By the end of production, big 340mm front brake discs were fitted as well. The late 80s and early 90s saw a raft of new electronics that changed the way cars drove. The Turbo R was also a recipient of many of these, a couple being in the gearbox. One reduced the engine's torque in the moment before a gear change in order to make it smoother, and the other was adaptive shift control, which would tune the gearbox to the way the car was being driven, a feature we still talk about on modern cars. The Turbo R also gained anti-lock brakes in 1987, adaptive dampers, and the electronic traction assistance system for 1997, its final year, which is basically a fancy traction control that goes alongside the viscous differential. Throughout its life, the Turbo R's bodywork evolved massively, from a relatively subtle beginning to an overt display of its power by 1997. Not only this, but the Bentley style matured itself throughout its life, becoming more individual and unmistakable. This one is the pinnacle of that, with the quad round headlamps and the red Bentley badges, alongside the large front spoiler and deeper rear bumper, both in body colour, along with the sills, making the car appear lower and more modern. The experience is rounded off by the flying bee on the bonnet. This wasn't standard fitment for this car, but looking down the bonnet towards it adds to the experience. The Turbo R, believe it or not, was the first Bentley to have alloy wheels, initially at 15 inches, but later to the 17 inches on this car. They help it appear more muscular and sporting, as well as filling out the wheel arches more on a lighter coloured car, such as this Silver Pearl example. For me, the paintwork is part of what makes this particular car so good looking, and it remains elegant despite its Bentleyness and its sporting pretensions. But the grille is small enough to remain elegant and subtle compared to a modern equivalent. The flashes of chrome as surround and on door handles complement the silver paintwork, and the coach lines on the sides break up the vast planes of steel. For such a big car, especially considering this is a long wheelbase model, it is very well proportioned with the 17 inch alloy wheels at the perfect size to enhance its sporting stance. Despite its 1980 vintage, the exterior holds up very well to the 90s standards, thanks to its nip and tuck here and there. In my view, the changes really helped explore and define the Bentley style. Unfortunately though, the older design does start to show up when you step inside. In here, it is exquisitely trimmed with its gorgeous burr walnut dashboard, Wilton carpets, and the lovely thick lambswool mats on top of them and this gorgeous light grey leather interior and also the blue on the top of the dashboard here that is then stitched into the light grey that follows the top of the dashboard and also on top of the doors as well you get the blue and it just contrasts the grey really nicely. It also has blue piping on the seats. But certain components do age this car. Most of them are down here in the centre console. They're all a little bit, little bit plasticky a little bit black, and they just look like they were from 1980, which they are, all before in a lot of cases as well. They just haven't updated the switch gear in the same way as they have done the outside, but that's completely understandable. But despite their age, they still function perfectly, and the quality of the switches themselves is really, really good. We'll start here with the climate control, which is done by these little sliders in the middle, uh, and then the switches for direction are just really, really nice use they feel quality and then down you have a little row of switches and I'll get to them later but again they are plastic but the hazard noise is the first thing I'm going to talk about which I don't know whether you can hear that or not but it is a lovely analog sound of a relay down there somewhere it's just something like that that pleases me so much then you have your automatic gear shifter obviously uh, P R N D, and then you can have it in third and second gear. There is an S button on the top for either snow or sport. I'm not 100% sure which one that is, but anyway, I think it will probably be a sport considering it's a Bentley, but who knows. 
And then you have a few switches that are completely unmarked. And now these top ones, the chrome ones, are adjusters for your wing mirrors. And then the ones below them are for your courtesy lights. Now these are completely unmarked and you've got to mess about with them to figure out what they do. But pushing the switch down turns on your standard interior lights. But in the sun visor here, these enormous sun visors actually, there's not actually a lot of windscreen visible. They are really, really big. And again, you have that lovely burr walnut. But if you push the switch upwards, you have your light up here. But that's strange, partially because it's down there, but also because there is already a micro switch in this sun visor. I don't know whether you can see that or not, but the light turns on and off depending on whether it's open or closed. So why couldn't they have just put another switch in the mirror? I don't know. But anyway, automatically dimming rear view mirror, which is a nice feature to have, especially for 1997. But then again, this is the height of luxury. So you'd expect these things. Another thing that's nice for 1997, if I take the key and I put it in the ignition, the steering wheel comes down to greet you. Again, that's something that is pretty normal by modern standards, but for 1997, it's just a nice feature to have. Below those unmarked switches are the controls for the seats, which again are unmarked, but they're pretty self-explanatory. They're switches for the seats. You can figure that out from the pattern. And then the last thing, which is obscured slightly by the center armrest, are your heated seats and your memory for your seats. And despite the fact that these, again, might not look 1997 in terms of quality, um, they certainly feel it because these switches sound and feel like the highest quality switches available, even if they don't quite look it. Now in the center armrest, you have quite a lot of storage space and also a CD changer because CD changers are a big thing, but it's nice having the CD changer right next to you here rather than having it in the boot like you would on a lot of cars. The radio itself is hidden behind this wooden panel, which is nice to have, especially as the radio in this one's been updated slightly to a modern Sony unit. So you can maintain the look by putting over this wooden panel. The ashtray again is fantastic. There is just everything about this car is just nicely built nicely designed as well. The dashboard itself is quite flat and yes, it is clearly from another era, but despite that, it is just so well finished that it really doesn't matter. Um, I love loving the fact that you have a good complement of gauges in one of these. Um, right in front of you, you have your tachometer and your speedometer. The speedometer, which goes up to 170 miles per hour and the tachometer that with a big old pushrod V8, only goes to four and a half thousand RPM, which is almost comedic, but that's a big old V8 for you. In the center, you have auxiliary gauges. You have your coolant temperature, oil pressure, uh, your fuel level, a clock, and your battery voltage. Now, the interesting thing about this fuel gauge is it also acts as an oil level. So if I go down to this center thing of switches here, turn the ignition on, and see it starts beeping away at me. And then I press this button, you can see the level goes to show your oil level. Now I keep mentioning the quality in this car and as much as they may have a slightly dodgy reliability record, the finish is again outstanding. And the one thing that I would point to as an indication of this are these vents here. In order to control the airflow, you have these plungers almost here which again, feel very well damped, very good quality, but the vents themselves are proper metal and they are just so nice to use. It is remarkable how well designed this all is. Now your driving controls, um, this big old flat steering wheel with four spokes is very, very of its time. Uh, this wood surround is not factory. Um, but it, this, this does feel aged and this brings down the ambience a bit a little bit, but this was completely normal for its era. But the controls itself, you only have one proper stalk here, uh, which controls your indicators. And again, just the quality of that is just fantastic. You have your main beam. There's no actual flash here, just your main beam. And then you push in for your washers. The wipers themselves are on this switch here. And again, as I said about the um, climate controls down there, 
this switch is just so nice to use and you have your intermittent down at the left now i am going to show you even though the windscreen is dry i think i can get away with this i just want to show you these windscreen wipers because the driver's side wiper is pantograph and that is just a lovely bit of engineering there on that side ah the things that make car people happy eh on the right hand side you have this big old stalk here for your cruise control and then the controls for your lights are down on the right hand side you do have automatic headlamps in this car um which again is a nice feature for 1997 that was just starting to come in at this point uh, in a lot of cars and you'd expect a, a high-end luxury car like this to have automatic lights by this era now these seats and yes they are made with very very high quality leather but they are harder than i expected them to be that doesn't mean they're uncomfortable of course but they are just more solid but they're also a lot bigger as well than i thought it, thought they'd be i can really really move about in these seats with an awful lot of nice squeaking from them as well but despite the big seats um, there isn't a lot of room everywhere else. I mean, I'm fine for headroom, me being five foot nine, but I seem a little bit more stuck for legroom down here, which is really strange, as this car is predictably enormous. But I, I, I seem to be conflicted with whether this car makes any kind of good use of its interior space or not. It just feels like they've, de they've designed everything and then thought, oh, oh no, we need place for the people to go. But anyway, you sit quite close to the door as well you, you sit you sit much closer to the door than you do to the center of the car which again feels a little bit weird not not wrong just a little bit weird but the doors are filled with the central locking controls the door handle which is just again you have steering wheel go up and you have your 90s warning alarm but just the quality of everything is lovely and you have your window controls down here on the door um, of course, on the driver's side, you have your controls for all four electric windows, and they are all completely unmarked, because why not? And storage-wise, despite the fact that this door is very, very wide, there's a lot of sill on the top of this door here, but there's almost no storage space in it. There is a door pocket about that big, which is only just big enough to fit a pen in it or something like that. I did mention before that centre console, which is quite deep, so there's some decent storage there. And your glove box, which opens quite violently. Uh, but in here you have your Bentley Turboir owner's manual in its little case here. And the quality of this is just wonderful. And so it's just the way it's written and the fonts and the prints are just classy, elegant. They're old fashioned um, and it feels like a quality piece of print here with this leather it's, I don't know whether it's real leather or not but this at least leather effect book it is fantastic and very very in-depth as well now the other item in this glove box which is quite surprising actually if I can get to it again big car so there's a big stretch going over here here is your Rolls Royce and Bentley service handbook and now in here this isn't just a service record this is how to actually do stuff which is very surprising i mean more modern cars don't have this kind of thing older cars like my metro over there do have um this kind of thing but this is really rather in depth and for a car like a rolls royce or a bentley i just wouldn't have expected it so yes the interior is the pinnacle of luxury in the late 90s even if this car does derive from 1980 it feels still well updated and it feels like a really quality place to be in the back of this particular car there's a little bit more space than there would be usually because this is a long wheelbase model which means there's four inches more in the wheelbase which means i've got stacks and stacks of knee room and that long wheelbase became the standard for this final year of production in 1997 but as with the front of the car it is trimmed exceptionally well the seats while the leather is quite hard it is again very comfy and the seats are very very big as well it feels more roomy actually in the back than it does in the front just thanks to the lack of a center console and things like that you sit very far back as well so you are behind the window almost in the c-pillar and the seats are reclined as well so you do relax into it even if leaning back into this headrest would be a little bit uncomfortable after a while 
it is still a lovely, lovely place to be. And even the difference between me sitting here and the armrest is a long reach over and then you're much closer to the door actually. But again, the blue leather topping the grey leather and the blue piping in the seats is just lovely. And again, the quality of the wood back here is just exceptional. Again, you have the blue carpet, which are just fantastic. And you also have the little footrests, which were a standard thing in Rolls Royce Bentley cars back in the day. And rather than having a standard grab handle back here, you get these things, which are apparently called Duchess handles or something i can't quite remember but yeah um so when your driver is getting a hoon on um you can grab onto these flappy duchess handles there is also a hook for a jacket over the back here and you do get obviously you get electric windows in the back again on these little tiny switches down here and each passenger in the back gets their individual ashtray and cigarette lighter and again these are chromed up to infinity and are just really really nice i mean the quality of that is remarkable it's actually quite heavy as well it's so much heavier than, than you'd expect it to be on a normal car back behind you you have more wood and you also have a little mirror as well i don't actually know what the point of that is you can't really see yourself in it unless you like duck through it so who knows but again you get a little switch here for your map reading light and then for your main light there and because you sit so far back you are sitting as i get as i said back in the c pillar just looking out of the window that way there's a lot of window between you and the b pillar up front now one thing i'm going to mention i don't usually mention it because they're a bit boring but i am going to mention the seat belts and there's a very good reason why I'm going to mention these seat belts and specifically these seat belt buckles. I mean, yes, these seat belt buckles do buckle into the seat in order to keep them in place and make them look a little bit neater, but that's not the reason I'm showing you it. The reason I'm showing you it is because these seat belts and the buckles are the same seat belts and the same seat belt buckles as in my Metro over there. I'm sure that'll either, that'll please some British Leyland people and it'll really annoy some Rolls Royce and Bentley people. But yes, the seat belts and seat belt buckles are straight from the British Leyland parts bin, which makes me so happy. But yes, your seat belt buckles do just buckle into the seat there. It'll be easy to show you this one. Um, they just clip into the seats there in order to stop them from flailing about while you're driving along. The final thing I'm gonna show you in the back is the most period of all the things in this car. And that is that inside this center armrest here is a mobile car phone, uh, which is wired into the car, obviously. Um, but apparently this is digital, so it should still work if you put a SIM card in it. Um, but yeah, there is nothing more late 90s in a luxury car than having one of these. And the final thing, if you lift up this armrest here, there is a third rear seat belt of course it's a lap belt that's just pretty standard for in the 90s but if we unhook this extra seat belt here there is a center rear seat belt which strikes me as slightly odd because there isn't a lot of space here and this is a bentley and it's not the kind of car i would have expected to have a small fifth seat i would have fully expected it just to be a four seater but there you go now underneath the Bentley badge on the back is a little keyhole and then to open the boot you just pull up here and then it opens as you expect. It doesn't quite open as high as I might expect it to and there isn't as much room in here as, as I'd expect either but that's partially due to the fact that there's an enormous fuel tank back there. But in here again the carpeting is just wonderful even if it's not quite big enough to fill the entire boot it's just very very high quality and this is the kind of thing I absolutely love if we pull open this here in here is your little tool to take the wheel trims off and this rack here is if I can pull it out your warning triangle and your jack and things like that so everything is stored harder to do with one hand uh, everything is stored 
on these shelves here. And again, if you can pull this one out, you have your Rolls Royce Bentley toolkit. So of course you have some gloves because you don't really expect to get your hands dirty while working on a Bentley or a Rolls Royce. And inside here is, if I can get it out and get it open, in here is a set of bulbs. And underneath here is your Rolls Royce toolkit. So theoretically, everything you need to work on one of these cars. There's more than a whiff of elitism and old England in all Bentleys. And to be honest with you, that and the fact that they're a little bit garish nowadays are both reasons I've never loved them. However, the only one I actively love for its historical significance, its approach to engineering, and the fact that it managed to look fast despite a rather sedate base car is the Turbo R. It really is wonderful and I feel a lesson to the modern era in making a car that isn't pretentious but is comfortable with its status as a supremely luxurious super saloon. From its launch in 1985 until the end in 1997, the Turbo R was by far the most successful Bentley SZ and the third most successful SZ altogether after the Silver Spirit and Silver Spur. 5,971 Turbo R's were built, with 1,524 of them being long wheelbase models like this one. Compare that to the next best-selling Bentley SZ model, the entry-level Bentley 8, which only sold 1,734, and you can see just how fundamental this car was. The Turbo R was succeeded by a final few flourishes of fast SZ, the Turbo RT being the spiciest of these, but that's a story for another day. The Gentleman Racer was back, as close as they could get to the best car in the world, and the best description I've heard of it is that it's an Edwardian sports car. And I think that's about right. This car was super important, not only in differentiating the Bentley mark, but creating the interest that helped lead Volkswagen to Bentley, therefore allowing the modern Bentley to exist at all. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please consider clicking like and subscribing to TwinCam as well. It really, really helps. And I'll have more videos coming along soon.